Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstory Mo. I'm Elizabeth, the events coordinator at Gibson's Bookstore, and we are very pleased to bring these two authors to your screens this evening. I am joined this evening by author Ravi Shankar. Um, and we are joined in conversation by Jennifer Acker, also an author of The Limits of the World, as they discuss tonight Robbie's book, Correctional, a memoir. This was supposed to be a launch week event, but I'm sure, as you have all heard, there's issues in the book world. I believe Europe printing presses ran out of paper over the week. Um, so that's that's great. Uh, but your book is coming. We, I believe, already have signed book plates in the store. So this is now a pre-launch event. And <laughs> if you can happily pre-order the book from Gibson's Bookstore, we will include one of those signed book plates in there. Jennifer's books are also available from Gibson's Bookstore. Thank you so much to the two of you for joining me this evening. Thank you for having us. I'm excited. Yes, absolutely. It's really a pleasure to be here. So um, to our audience members, we will be answering audience questions later in the evening. So please feel free to toss those into the chat sidebar or the Q&A. We will be answering those later. Don't worry, we will get to them. Um, if you would like to converse with your fellow audience members, please make sure your chat settings are set to everyone. Um, and please do throw some kind words into the chat for Ravi so I can share them with him later. Um, but now, please join me in welcoming these two authors as they discuss correctional. Good evening, folks. Take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, it's great to be here in neighboring Massachusetts, um, and um, and it's great to be here uh, with Ravi. Um, we, it was a treat to work on an excerpt of this memoir, uh, which we published in the um, the literary magazine that I edit called The Common, uh, which I'll try to throw a link in for um, a little bit later when I can distract myself and look only at, look only at the chat. Um, but so yeah, now that I've had the pleasure of reading the whole thing, you know, getting the getting the context um, that comes uh, with this book, all of the pieces are fitting together and some of the, you know, some of those like, like little tantalizing bits that were in the excerpt have been have been fleshed out. So I think we're going to begin um, with, with a reading from that part of the book. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And I thought I would share. Um, and of course, you know, correctional is uh, a, a not yet uh, a, a available in hard copy, but available for pre-order. And I urge you to support your local indie bookstore and uh, buy it from Gibson's. Uh, but um, uh, yes, I thought it was a fascinating process because um, uh, Jennifer, if I, I, you don't mind me saying, is a terrific editor. And <laughs> Uh, I had sent her really a, a, a chapter of the book, and um, it had to be turned into something um, quite distinctive to stand alone as a discrete essay, um, which is published um, in the common. But there actually is a little chunk of it, and I will read it directly from here, that is um, the same uh, as um, in the memoir. And um, it takes place, um, you know, this story is about a, a lot of different things. It's a story I never imagined I would write about a really excruciating period of my life, but it's also about my parents' immigration from South India and this time that I uh, moved there in the middle of my life in Northern Virginia uh, as a third grader because my grandmother got uh, ill. She had uh, cancer, actually, and so we went, moved back to take care of their, her, and I was there for uh, over that that year, and I went to school there, and um, it kind of represented in some ways a rupture in my life as I think about it. And so I'll, I'll read you just a little bit from that section. Um, I was uh, living in, in Ch Madras, now known as, known as Chennai, and I was going to a school there um, called the MAK Convent, which was in fact run by nuns who did believe in corporal punishment. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll just um, begin with this um, uh, arrival in India. Back in 1981 in Manassas, a Northern Virginia suburb known for the battles of Bull Run and Lorena Bobbitt, I came home from playing touch football in the neighborhood park and was greeted with some grim news. Appa's mother had been diagnosed with an advanced stage of colon cancer, and as the eldest son, it was Appa's duty to take care of her. Yet he had a job on the other side of the world and so could not fulfill his filial duty. Instead, in the middle of my third grade year, Amma told me that she and my sister would be moving back to South India without my father to take care of my grandmother. 
That's what familial duty entailed, no questions asked. In a whirlwind that summer, my youngest sister yet to be born, my little sister Rajani and I were swept up with her suitcases and herded into the family's aquamarine Chevy Nova to bring, begin the long journey to Madras, the city where my father had been raised. Thinking now about my own daughter's independence at that age, we were back then, I recall having no say in the matter at all, not even the illusion that I might have a say. No big goodbye to my classmates, no sense of what the journey would entail. I do clearly remember tussling with my sister on the plane over a pair of plastic pin-on wings from the stewardess as flight attendants were called back then. I remember drinking my first mini can of Coke on the plane. I was dressed in a military uniform with a peak cap and a holster with a toy pistol that today would never have be allowed in an airport, let alone admired by the flight crew. We arrived at a cabin or soil airport where large rotary fans pushed heat from space to space. Numerous men in vestis, the colorful cotton garments men wear tied around their waists in lieu of pants, jockeyed to carry my family's bags. Appa firmly rebuffed them with a coarse brand of tummel I had never heard him use before. The throng outside the airport in its sheer mass and press of humanity, holding signs and madly gesticulating was terrifying. Yet somehow, even before my father seemed to find them, I recognized my extended family whom I had not seen in years. I had been to India when I was six months old and then three years old and met some of my relatives in the US so I felt enough of a sense of connection to wave wildly at them. They waved back. A group of them stood together, all men in short sleeves and brill creamed hair. They greeted us with back slaps and loaded us into an ambassador taxi to take us back to my grandfather's flat. The images of Madras at night are dusty and hallucinatory. I stood with my forehead pressed to the streaking taxi window while my sister sat with her hands clapped over her ears for no noise I can now remember. We slept on the floor of the small apartment in the, long, in the large concrete building that first night, surrounded by our suitcases. In the morning, we were woken by coal birds and the cleaning woman who swept the door sill with a broom made from a straw sheet. My grandmother, even though she was going through chemotherapy, crafted an intricately looping and geometrically precise colon with ground rice powder on her front stoop to begin the day with auspiciousness. And instead of Cheerios, I had a breakfast of idli and sambar. Everything shone with marvelous new sounds and colors. Instead of waiting at the corner for the school bus, I sprinted to the rooftop with my cousins to play soccer and cricket. Our brown bodies glistening with sweat, we would weave and faint through the antennas and yards of colored cloth hung out to dry. Catching my breath, I wondered what would happen if I were to kick the ball over the parapet and then consider for a moment where I was so far from where I had come. When I think back on first experiencing India as a child, my memories are cliches of exoticism and colorful holy tumult. Throngs of Naga sadhus clad in only marigold garlands chanting in the Ganges, each course of a thali served on a banana leaf that could be scooped into the mouth with the hands. Naked children pissing outside of makeshift shanty towns formed of corrugated tin and cardboard. Enormous gaudy golden marriage halls blaring Baba Ki Run Hoon into the night sky, an assemblage of previously unknown uncles, cousins, and siblings, all sleeping together in a giant family bed. How can the mind take a hold of such a country, E.M. Foster writes in a passage to India? Generations of invaders have tried, but they remain in exile. She, India, has never defined. She's not a promise, only an appeal. Or as Arundhati Roy would put it later, in India, the wilderness still exists, the unindoctrinated wilderness of the mind, full of untold secrets and wild imaginings. Both condensations of the country are illuminative, illuminative and problematic, for India is much more than an appeal or a signifier of an ancient culture. And what is wildness, really? From the standpoint of someone other than Roy, such a description could feel vaguely Orientalist, and yet those qualities of being variegated, numinous, and chaotic certainly differentiate the country, which cannot be captured in swift, turgid generalizations, mine or anyone else's. There was something so unspeakably innocent and startling about being in India, a culture where teenage boys stroll the streets holding hands, or the skies darken with a downpour of fierce rain that might sop up everything for weeks at a time. There are six seasons in India, 
the pre-vernal and monsoon added to the normal four. I wish I had known back then how to hitch my star to India's Ratha, one of those oldest chariots in the world from the Rig Veda, and to talk smack back to the pimply-faced rat tail who said my feet smell like rotten curry on the school bus. How do you talk to a white kid from Manassas about Vedic pride and the Ashoka chakra? I wish that kid on the bus could have met my grandfather, who though seemingly ancient was surprisingly strong and would engulf me in a bear hug each time I walked by the wooden rope Rajasthani chair in which he liked to spend his afternoons. Sorry for the Kashmiris, he would boo in his breath a mixture of clove and copper. But India never invaded another country. We invented chess, algebra, calculus, surgery, navigation, zero, even your, uh, how do you say, snakes and ladders. An army of ants can wear away the stubbornest stone. When I tried to squirm free from his lap, he held me down tighter. Hippocrates, ha, the wandering physician Sharaka had consolidated the earliest schools of medicine known to mankind. Ayurveda, long before the togas, and we beat the Brits at cricket and found water on the moon. Never forget your roots, he trumped before I was able to wriggle free and hide behind Amma. I was utterly unsure why we had traveled across the oceans to take care of my grandparents because they seemed perfectly able to take care of themselves. How little I knew back then about how my grandmother was losing her hair and in constant pain, nor did I have the knowledge or prescience back then to push back on my grandfather's assertions to bring up the Chola kings whose maritime adventures led them to occupy parts of Sri Lanka, or how Punjab King Ranjit Singh annexed parts of Afghan territory in the early 19th century, or the fact that the border disputes between India and Nepal and Pakistan persist to this very day. I wish I'd known, uh, known how the BGP party, the right-wing Hindu nationalist political party, would take power in India under the auspices of social conservatism and Hindu values, leading to the destruction of mosques, mob violence, and the disenfranchisement and criminalization of the country's minority Muslim population. National pride is never complicated. And at that age, Indian pride was just as foreign to me as the made in America trucker caps and belt buckles that proliferated during the Reagan era in the US, or the red MAGA hats that show up at political rallies these days. Being neither Indian nor American enough, I tended to regard any outbreak of nationalism with a healthy dose of skepticism. Plus, I had been acculturated in the era of the grand melting pot, taught to liquefy those rich differences that prevented me from being a true American, to blend in. I never suspected that the act of folding those six seasons into four would carry its own trauma, because back then the pressure to conform to an idea of Indianness while also trying to assimilate to a life in Virginia had inverted. Now I was in India as an American and possessed with the sense of intoxicating adventure. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it was uh, it was wonderful to hear you read that. I mean, so I think the the first question I'd like to start out is is where you just ended with this um, uh, this very evocative inversion of you know being the child of immigrants in America and feeling like um, an outsider in your elementary school and then being uprooted and moved uh, to India which is also not a place that um, that you're familiar with terribly or feel very at home at uh, so I'm wondering if you can describe like the different kinds of outsiderness, like the outsiderness that you felt in India and the one that you felt um, here in, um, in the US when, when you were growing up to sort of compare those two. And then, um, you know, when, when you came back, what that, what that re-entry was like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, um, and it was really quite different and unexpected to go to India and all of a sudden they thought of me as American. I was the American cousin and um, they thought I sounded like John Wayne and, you know, and they wanted to, and that was back then when um, technology would kind of reach uh, Asia a little later or something. So there was some video games like Donkey Kong that hadn't quite made it over to India yet. And so I could regale my cousins with this idea, but there, there was also a sense that I didn't really, uh, I was awkward eating with my hands and uh, my tumble had this accent that they all thought was really uh, hilarious. And so, uh, you know, it was a different kind of, um, 
uh, I felt like there were there. I was um, uh, kind of respected or mystified in a way for being American, uh, and that was different than in uh, growing up in Manassas at, uh, um, as one of the only South Asian families in in this uh, school. Um, you know, there was some overt um, kind of racist teasing. I mean, I, I used I uh, mentioned that many immigrants have the quintessential lunchbox moment, but my mother used to pack me these delicious thalies of South Indian food, and I would be mocked for it, of course. And so I, I took to dumping it out on the way to the school bus and just starving, in fact. Uh, and so I'm in, you know, which is kind of crazy to think about those pressures as a young kid. Um, the re-entry um, was a little bit difficult in part because my parents in India, as uh, in Hinduism, one of the things that you do to kind of um, get benediction uh, is to shave your head at various temples. And I've actually had my head shaved at uh, five or six different South Indian temples. And my parents saw fit to do this a right a week or so before we were returning to India and I was gonna start uh, the next year of school. So that wasn't the best move. Uh, <laughs> cancer patient jokes and it was you know already going to be kind of difficult um and i i think that um i you know and i, I write about this a little bit i think i took solace in, in some i felt like i was when i came back i was being teased and yet i felt possessed of this knowledge that these other kids didn't have i'd seen mm. a part of the world they didn't have know about and so that allowed me to cultivate this other uh, uh space that i could keep private and that was impervious to their bullying in some way and do you think that um, that time in India has had some long-term effects uh, in in your life? That it, does it did the does it return to you in in some way? Um, in you know beyond just the things that like the connections with the family members? Do you think there there's any way that it it really shaped you um, moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think for one thing, it definitely deepened my uh, knowledge of Tamil, which I can speak and understand. And I've done some translation of um, Andal, this eighth century um, goddess. I don't think I definitely wouldn't have done that without this year kind of immersing myself in the language. Um, and, uh, you know, I love the sense of family that exists in India. And it's, it can, I, I suppose, be a little bit intrusive, but it's this vast idea that the, you know, the nephew of uh, a second cousin um, wants you to come and is a great host and opens their doors to you. And people kind of are looking out for each other in this communal way um, that I, I would love to, or, you know, replicate in, in the U.S. in some way. I don't, I don't, I love that sense of um, community. And, um, and I think also uh, that was my first real exposure to um, the Indian epics, the Bharatanatyam, um, the Rig Veda, uh, the Ramayana. And I used to read these Amartita Katha comic books that had all of these Indian deities, Hanuman, and uh, as these cartoon characters. And I became fascinated with an alternative form of mythology that I was not learning about in school. Uh, you know, we learned about the Greeks and maybe even Norse myths, but certainly nothing about Indian myth. Uh, and I, I found it to be a very rich and imaginative uh, 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 place that's since continued to inspire me, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, one, one tiny thing to sort of bring us to the larger book, cor correctional, you know, that so this is just one, what you read is just one small part of it, uh, one chapter. Um, so I, yeah, I was interested to see that that the way you structured correctional was um, through the seasons and through the you know and and through the particular names for um, uh, uh, for the seasons, and so I wanted to ask you you know why yeah why, why that structure for for the book what what meaning does it have for the themes of the book and and how does it you know draw on some of those experiences that you were just talking about. Yeah, um, and um, in, in India, there is, I, I mentioned in that reading, the uh, monsoon and the pre-vernal in addition to the four seasons that we know. And, um, and you know, uh, I'm sure uh, you can attest to this too, but a, a book is a really collaborative process in a lot of ways. And you get a lot of feedback in it, you know, right at the end of one of my drafts, um, though, I was thinking about um, how I could make the book even you know, more intimate in some way. And I felt like I wanted to write, and I was thinking perhaps of um, that great book by Tainishi Coates, Between the World and Me, where it's an epistolary book addressed to a son. And I felt like I, I want to kind of directly address some people and in that way, make it a, a correctional. And it, it felt, felt to me that the process of assimilation in some ways was like squashing six seasons down into four that there were things that had to be pared away and things that were left out. 
And so I thought um, I'll, I'll write these six letters to people who are important to me and they'll form a kind of architectural spine um, for the narrative. And uh, each of them will be one of the kind of six seasons. And then the, the symphony of the book can kind of take place between them. And it became a little bit of a framing device, but really, you know, it was my partner, Julie, who uh, kind of had the idea of these letters. And, um, and then uh, it was something that I added very late that I, I think um, adds another dimension to the book that wasn't there that I'm, I'm kind of excited about. Right, right. Yeah, there's a, there's a way of um, a, yeah, marrying the themes of the book through the structure, mm -hmm. um, which I think, think what we all try to do, but is, is quite difficult <laughs> in practice. Um, yeah, so, the, um, so the, the memoir, as we have sort of, as people have, have heard, you know, it, it both traces your upbringing in, in, uh, as a child of immigrants, so as an Indian American family, um, as well, uh, and, and as a in a rather strict family, it sounds like your your father was, was quite strict, um, and um, it sort of uh, marries that with your interactions with the criminal justice system, and culminating in your spending 90 days in the Hartford Hartford Correctional Center, and then there are threads as well that include your career as an academic and some uh, some of your um, some of your relationships, your, uh, your romantic relationships. And so, you know, I, I, and there, it's, it's quite a complicated book with, with a lot of threads. And I just wonder in the, um, in the beginning, when you first thought, I, I, I need to tell this story, what was, you know, what was the original impetus? What, what was the, the story that you felt most pressed to tell? Mm, well, I mean, I, I think it was when I, and of course, the, the book kind of tells the story of these um, various encounters with the criminal justice system, one, uh, a wrongful arrest, and then subsequently where uh, I, I wasn't innocent, um, although the 90 days I had to, to serve, I will say, for, for, you know, driving on a suspended license was this, is the same amount of time that the swimmer who raped an unconscious Chanel Miller had to do, so it says something about the American criminal justice system, but I think that moment when I realized I was I was actually going to have to do this time, three months of my life. I felt like the only way that I could survive this this time was to imagine myself as an immersion journalist parachuted down into this space and that I would do something as a writer with this material. And then once I was there, what I didn't realize is that and all of my expectations about jail were overturned in a lot of ways. I wasn't in a cell. I was in a dorm with 60 other men. Uh, and many of them shared their stories with me, um, stories of their upbringing and their families. I, in some ways, I became part of this community, especially this first, you know, my sentence was a little unusual in that it was split up over the course of a year and a half. And so, but this first 45 days that I did, um, I really got to know these men pretty well. And they made me promise to do something with their stories because they said, you have a voice uh, and we really don't. And, um, you, you know, whatever you can do to let people know of our conditions. And so then I, I th uh, when I agreed to that, I knew I had to turn this into a book. And it, it also felt like I wanted to reclaim my own story, which at the time this was happening, of course, I was being promoted to full professor at a university in Connecticut. And I kind of created this huge local controversy. And it, it felt like this, and a lot of the reporting, and this is, um, we're now in the era of, you know, critiquing journalism, but I, um, I felt like so much of the reporting was sensationalized and inaccurate in a lot of ways. And I felt like I needed to tell um, the, the whole story. Uh, and uh, and that's when I, I really felt like, okay, I need to write this book. Right. And so when when you first yeah received that that sentence, like you said, in the ninety days, the the you know three months of your life, um, what were um, do you remember what your sort of most intense fears were when you were you know facing that before you had before you had started and. Um, and were they realized to some extent? Were some of them upended? Mm. Um, well, I will say uh, my first and biggest fear was because my attorney had kind of, I wasn't convicted of anything. I, uh, this was a pretrial detention to satisfy the state, which is such an ominous phrase whenever I hear it. Um, but 
and no one really um, knew about it. My attorney worked it out so that, and I, I write about this this one summer where I did 45 days and then I got out and I flew to Hong Kong to teach my graduate students. And then I flew back to do another two weeks. It was very, very surreal. So my fear was that people would find out that this was happening because it had not been covered mm -hmm. in the media. It only really got covered when this 90 days was finishing up and my promotion was being finalized. Um, so that fear did come to be realized. But then, you know, I mean, I think, like many of us, my ideas about jail have been shaped by popular culture and, you know, shows like um, Prison Break and um, uh, Oz. And uh, so, of course, I was uh, afraid of um, physical sexual violence. Um, you know, I didn't know what I was going to encounter. I felt like being someone who had, was educated and had privilege compared to some of these men would be perhaps problematic. Uh, and... Um, and then the the loneliness. Um, I had in, in the book, I detailed this wrongful arrest when I just spent 72 hours in central booking and that felt like an eternity. So 90 days, I just, I didn't know how I would be equipped to um, to do that time, I think. Right. And I, I suppose the last thing was my, my daughter uh, was old enough at, at that time to kind of know what was happening. My ex-wife and I made the decision to, to tell her to frame it as a kind of a teaching moment uh, and then she, I think she kind of told some friends on the playground after that, which, but, you know, and in the small town that, well, that that's what happens. But um, yeah, so these were all some of my fears, some of which came true. I have to say, I never really, there was a, a moment or two where I was faced with a little bit of a physical confrontation, but I never really did feel um, in fear or danger for my, and it might've been the facility I was in. And, um, but um, so that fear, I don't think, really actually came came true. Right. And um, and what about that? Um, yeah, the, just the interactions with um, with the other people in your dorm. You describe all the all all of the differences. Um, you know, ninety percent of the men that um, who were in your dorm were black and Latino, as you say. Um, you know, um, many of them weren't able to finish high school uh, for various reasons, and. He, you were a college professor, um, so there were, you know, quite a few things that set you apart. So it's, you know, an, another, you know, another moment of being a cultural outsider. And so how 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 were those relationships forged um, with uh, with the people that that you were living with? I think in in part, and this is maybe what is uh, unique about my story, is that I'm someone who um, is is poised on that kind of equilibrium point, someone who's benefited from enormous privilege all my life, and yet someone who's also been discriminated against for my ethnicity and for my skin color. And so um, I think that was one of the first ways that I kind of, because as, as you mentioned, there were so many men of color in there, which I knew theoretically and statistically, but to kind of witness it firsthand uh, and to say, uh, you know, I have kind of dealt with some of the same discrimination was one thing that connected me. Um, it, it, in there, um, there, there are these 60 men and you stay in these um, dorms and these kind of uh, bunk beds and the space that three of these bunks make is your cube. And so you form this kind of a uh, closer relationship with your cube mates because there are moments where um, there is a count and you're required to be in that space and you can't move around. Uh, and uh, um, these men, I think, because you know you have to kind of uh, live with them, uh, um, they... Uh, uh, I did initially I wasn't telling people anything I wanted to disappear really I wanted to just kind of be in the wall an observer just taking notes um, but when I started talking to them and the, um, the only thing to do there wasn't a lot of there's no rehabilitation as I described but there's a lot of time to be passed and the way that that's done is by uh, spinning yarns and bullshitting and talking about all kinds of stuff and um, you know um, I, I, I suppose the um, I realized that these men were not really any different. They were emotionally complex and intelligent. Some of them uh, hadn't um, finished uh, high school, but they were certainly ingenious in their own way. Uh, and I, I think um, being uh, uh, not being in judgment of them at all. And um, there were a couple of them also that felt like, you know, I was a man of discernment and taste. And so uh, I could maybe, you know, they wanted to curry favor. And I actually, I found out a couple of things like I'm better at basketball than I realized that helped make me friends. And I'm much worse at chess. 
uh, uh, unfortunately. And, you know, I was a pretty good cards player, so I would play spades. And um, so things like just kind of um, ingratiating myself into the social fabric rather than right. staying aloof. I mean, I think that first uh, f- few days, first week, I was just really apart from those men, but I, I soon started to, uh, in- to join that community. Yeah. And uh, was it rare to, to have this kind of arrangement of coming and going the, the, way, the way that you did um, so that, you know, you'd, you would be able to do some of the time and then go away and do something like teach and then come back? And um, it, or is, that, is that a common arrangement? And, and how do you think that affected you, the sort of the coming and going also? No, and and this is one of the things that was picked up on. Uh, you know, I had uh, a few uh, this Republican senator turned Hartford column columnist who said the special arrangement mm. uh, that he's gotten because of his private attorney. And um, probably I had a, a really good attorney. Um, but, but truthfully, what I came to realize is had I done all of those uh 90s days at once. I mean, each time that you go in is a humiliating and traumatizing experience. And you have to kind of be reified into an object anew and, you know, open your mouth and show your throat and spread your ass cheeks and get the tans and then um, be reintegrated into a new community of men. And so I went into it after this first stint where I actually kind of felt like I connected with these guys. And I went back thinking I had it figured out. And I was with a whole different group of men and all of a sudden, uh, n- not so much. Uh, you know, they they called me Bin Laden and Osama, and you know, uh, and so that uh, that um, arrangement was um, a, a little uh, w- w- different. And I, I guess I, I'm grateful because it allowed me to do things like teach. But I ended up feeling, and my attorney would always say, "Oh, this next little stint is going to be enough. You know, you've done enough." And then he said, oh, no, the judge wants you to kind of keep going. Mm-hmm. And it really was, I think it was five separate stints. And so, right. you know, students were preparing for, you know, fall break or Christmas break. It was like I was preparing for another week at HCC and right. not really sure for what reason, what redemptive purpose. But. Right. Well, that's the whole question about <laughs> about prison in general, right? <laughs> what is <laughs> what is supposed to be happening mm. during, um, yeah, during that time. Um, yeah, um, I mean, yeah, that, the, the, the coming and going sounds, uh, sounds incredibly difficult for the, you know, the, the fracturing of, uh, no, not least because of the fracturing of the relationships that you, that you were building up. Um, um, could you describe the, the moment and that sort of dis, uh, disjuncture between what was happening inside and what was happening um, outside um, when you were promoted to full professor? Yeah, this is another, I mean, there were so many kind of whiplash moments in there. And so that moment was when, um, and of course, I had, uh, I'd been at uh, Central Connecticut State University for uh, over a decade, 11 years, and um, I had exceeded expectation in every criteria of evaluation from teaching to publication. And so um, all of this had been signed off on by the chair, the dean, the provost, the president, and just needed to be really essentially rubber stamped by the board of regents. And it just so happened that that was just when I was going to be finishing off these 90 days, this last little stint that I had to do. And um, while I was in there, um, I have a really good friend, Andy Thibault. I don't know if he's here, but a kind of investigative journalist. And he came to to visit me and he said, I've got bad news for you. And it turned out that this Kevin Rennie, this uh, Hartford uh, Hartford current columnist, had got a hold of this information. And so it became this huge story, local story um, in Connecticut. I mean, even though I was, you know, only convicted of misdemeanors, I think there was no less than seven articles about me in, in the current, uh, and uh, um, and it was framed in such a way. Uh, now I came to find out it was an election year. The board of regents is appointed by the Democratic governor, and so it's easy to kind of take shots using me as this kind of faculty member run amok and. You know, the way the story was framed was someone that had kind of gambling issues and addiction problems and and especially how and this person is shaping the young minds, oh, the poor young minds kind of rhetoric, right? And of course, this, these were college students and nothing that had happened had anything to do with the right. subject matter. And, you know, and then it raised there was another Connecticut legislator who used to um, use this moment to try to mandate that teachers have a le- level of um, background checks that his own body of legislation doesn't have. 
Right? Um, so, um, but so all of these things were happening on the outside, and I was humiliated. I mean, I knew my colleagues were very upset with me. I was putting the department in a negative light. My marriage at this time was falling apart, and I, I had lost touch with a lot of my friends. People, you know, what do you say when somebody is in jail? It doesn't make sense to a, a lot of, and yet. When, and this news news was actually reported on television uh, and on the evening news. And when this happened, uh, and it happened in Hartford Correctional, all of a sudden the inverse happened to me inside. All of the men saw this news and I became a kind of a folk hero. All of a sudden people were like, yo, there's a professor. People were giving me free food and they were asking me uh, advice, marriage advice, and to help them you know, with their legal cases. And uh, um, even correctional officers were asking me about how they could get their college degree. Uh, and so it was this very strange, on the inside, I was actually being celebrated, whereas on the outside, I was being ostracized and shamed. And it, it, it was a very, very surreal and bizarre feeling indeed. And so that, um, so do you think before people didn't know that you were a professor and then they, that this was the moment of learning that, um, you know, that you were and, and there was some respect for that, for that status? Or, I mean, what do you think was, was behind um, those, yeah, th those, those accolades and the warmth, which, which this news was, was greeted? I, I think part of it was just um, uh, the validation that somehow being on television for anything brings. I mean, some of these men mm -hmm. were accused of much far more serious crimes, and yet there hadn't been any coverage. Um, and I think, uh, yes, I mean, the uh, uh, idea that someone among them had done something and it was minor enough, but yet it, it uh, was on the news must make me somewhat of an important person. Uh, and uh, you know, it was funny when the news came, and of course, I ended up keeping my promotion. I, um, the Board of Regents kind of uh, allowed me to have it. And when this news was reported, the entire dorm, you know, burst down celebration, like, Professor, they're going to let you keep your promotion. And, you know, and I, which was all great. But I was also worried that, yeah, you know, now these men kind of know who I am, where I am. Um, so, you know, it's, but. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think that that must have been part of it, too. And they felt like if somebody like me uh, was in there with them and I uh, have, you know, had a, had a job, I could potentially help them in some way. And so I right. did um, help, you know, write letters and make phone calls and help the men as much as I could. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of thinking about the, I mean, and I think it's, it's time that we can begin, you know, opening up for questions and, and, uh, and taking uh, questions from folks that are here. Um, but just to, to ask one more question about the, the continuity of that, of that community, or, um, is that you have done some theater work with a, with a Boston group, is, uh, is that right, by, um, by in, in which the actors have all been impacted by the criminal justice system in some way. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the, the aims of that group and the kinds of works that you do and, and what it's like uh, to participate in, in that and to go from being a writer to an actor, you know, what, what is that like too? Yeah, uh, that's the move I never really imagined making, but yes, uh, I'm a part of this great uh, group called And Still We Rise. It's a Boston-based uh, theatrical company, and they are all comprised of people who have been impacted in some way by the criminal justice system. So some people have done time, others like there's a, a grandmother, uh, Lois, whose sons and grandsons have all been in and out of prison, and she's been the one in the waiting room kind of trying to sort out their stuff. And, you know, of course, the, this the mass incarceration causes generational damage, and the, um, many of her um, uh, 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 grandchildren are raised in single homes, for example. And so this, I, I just connected with Dev Luthra, the executive director. He invited me first to come observe and then to be a writer. And then he said, you know what, I, I want you to kind of tell your stories. And it's been amazing. It's such a different model than the MFA model, um, because what we're trying to do is create the conditions for everyone to feel safe to tell their own story. And it's not so much editing their story as um, allowing for 
Uh, and, and sometimes those stories can, can be traumatic. Sometimes the actors have to stop uh, the work, but um, it is uh, a, a weekly meeting and I have been now going regularly for about a year and we're just in production for our next show, which will be coming out. And I think in the past they did live shows all over the country and in, in correctional facilities in the States. Now it's all being done on Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm still a little bit sheepish, but I've been told that uh, I'm, I'm getting a little better as an actor, but. You know, and so, yeah, so what is the, um, how, how is the material uh, written? Are, are these, um, you know, you're, you all are working together to write the stories that come from individuals in the group? Um, well, yes, yes, in part, people are writing um, some of their own stories and then work with the, um, the producers um, on how to enact those stories because of their, of course, they're not just meant to be on the page, but right. We, and, and sometimes then we'll have other actors do some of the voices uh, and, and it, 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 it really is a collaborative practice, but um, uh, people write really their own material and it's a, a matter of trying to help them perform that material as best as possible. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, well, let's see if we do have, um, uh, if we have any questions or uh, Elizabeth, if, if there's anything that you've been thinking about that you would like to ask. Or... Sure. Well, someone asked, um, have you kept in touch with any of your dorm mates since you finished serving? Mm. Um, well, I have made it attempts. I was um, one of my cube mates, Leonard. I was an old Vietnam vet, actually surprisingly prescient. He had these apocalyptic visions of super viruses and climate caused disasters. And this was like a decade ago. So I was like, oh, Leonard. Um, but he uh, wanted me to reach out to his son. The number that he gave me didn't work. I wrote a letter to a couple of the guys that were in there. And I, I thought I would hear back from them, but I didn't. But knowing what I know of prison bureaucracy, it's not even really clear if the letters would have got to them at all in the first place. So um, I, I, I've decided that the um, I wanted, I, especially with this book out, and there are a couple of uh, people in, in this book who I would love to have a copy of it. So I'm going to try. Um, but I've um, been doing more advocacy work, um, um, general uh, national and local advocacy work um, uh, as a means of kind of sustaining this, these relationships. Um, you said that the men you were with asked you to tell their stories. Uh, how did they learn about your skill in wordsmithing? Uh, was that before or after the TV coverage? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think some of the men knew that I was um, a, a teacher and I, uh, there was a lot of talk about hip hop and um, you know uh, poetry and slam and so I could kind of uh, talk a little bit of, of, about that and um, I had this one experience with this um, uh, Kendrick was his name he went by chaos everyone in jail has a nickname and, and uh, uh, chaos was one of the most uh, he he's probably the best actor who's never acted because he his face he was just totally transparent so that you could see whatever he was feeling at any moment and his face it was so capable of contorting to any emotion. Um, but he revealed to me that uh, that he was illiterate. He was a heroin addict, and uh, he was illiterate. And so we worked together on um, his, his letters and his alphabet. And he ended up um, writing his first letters, and he stitched a little handkerchief for Aaliyah, his uh, daughter, um, which I still, you know, I'm really moved by that pedagogical moment in in whatever way. But you know. He, when he tells me his stories, he didn't, I mean, his schools were underfunded. He lived in his um, uncle's car in the backseat of the Buick for a, a winter. He was kicked out of foster care. I mean, he, he didn't really have a chance in a lot of ways. Um, what was your nickname? Well, the, that was the <laughs> professor, you said. I was a professor, but some people called me, uh, you know, I, uh, a lot of na different names, uh, uh, India and, uh, you know, uh, Bin Laden. Someone called me uh, Allah Abdul Nabi, who I guess was an old UNC basketball player. I had to look that one up. Uh, you know, I mean, there were certainly some kind of racist tropes, but what I found was that having a nickname made you one of the community. So once you kind of had a nickname, it was like, okay, you're people, you're, you're part of the gang in some way. And so, and you know, when you have a name like Ravi Shankar, you get pretty immune to uh, being called just about anything. When you, you know, share a name with India's most famous musician, it's like, okay, names are not really something you need to cling to your identity to. Right? Um, 
Fair enough. Uh, question from Peter. Uh, what did you learn about yourself from writing this memoir? Oh, man. Um, I do think that this is um, in some ways um, a, a deeply spiritual memoir and it's a, a story of kind of um, growth and, and redemption. And uh, I think I learned that there was these kind of um, sh shadowy conflicting parts of myself and that I wasn't really fully living in my truth. Uh, I think I also learned that um, what being an American means is also um, being aware of and advocating for those who are homeless and those who are imprisoned. I have a statistic, uh, we talk about the one percenters or at all, but 3% of Americans at any given time are on probation, parole, or in prison. And that when you overlay that with the racial demographic of who is being incarcerated, it's a pretty, so after seeing what I've seen, I can't unsee it. And so it's made me, I think, a lifelong advocate for um, trying to reform things. Um, and then I think, you know, I'm a poet and uh, the work that it took to write a, a memoir was really quite arduous. And every draft, there was another excruciating layer of unpeeling. And I felt like I had to get real. I mean, I think the early drafts of the book, I was defensive. I was bitter. I was, you know, kind of pissed off. I mean, I knew I had, you know, fucked up in some ways, but in other ways, I felt like I was being treated unfairly. And I had to kind of go through all of that to get to the, the core of the story, which I feel like is maybe not just my story, but a quintessential American story in some ways. And so, yeah, and then having come through the other side of it, Peter, I'm, I'm pretty sick of myself. And the next thing I write will be like a fabulous erotic noir or something, you know, it's not, not gonna be uh, directly self-referential, I think. Uh, Janine wants to know, do you still teach? I do, I'm, so I'm teaching at Tufts University uh, now, um, teaching journalism and, and, and creative writing. Um, um, I'm working as a, a part-timer now as a lecturer. And so it'd be great to be a full-time again. And, you know, I mean, this is what I, I've been helping people a little bit with re-entry and um, we talk about intentional in inclusion. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I should just mention, I, you know, I was teaching at Bryant University as well. And um, a semester after I was done, was teaching with them and a couple of days before I was supposed to begin new classes, um, I was told by human resources this misdemeanor had come up, even though I've published widely about it, and uh, they couldn't ha hire me back, and they couldn't have me back. And um, the irony is that their uh, day of understanding reading is uh, Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. So, you know, it, it just it shows the kind of the gulf between rhetoric and deed, I think. And uh, so, I, you know, I, I still feel like I have to kind of like fight in a lot of ways to, to reestablish myself. But I love the students I had at Tufts, they're, they're very talented and I, I'm, I love teaching as well. So I'm, I'm grateful to be able to be doing it. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, a question for you. Your uh, book, The Limits of the World, uh, the novel was a Massachusetts Book Award honoree. What's next for you? Um, well, I'm all I'm sort of steeped in on the on the memoir side of things uh, now. So I've been I wrote a short piece called um, Fatigue, which is sort of a, a memoir essay, um, which um, I published a couple of years ago about marriage and chronic illness. Um, and I've been expanding that into a book. So that's um, that's hopefully what is next. Excellent. Excellent. Um, all right, uh, one last question, uh, I think here. Ooh, where did it go? Where did it go? It has disappeared. Um, did the, you've mentioned some of the things that you learned about, uh, oh, actually I like that one better. Ravi, uh, you used to run an online literary journal called Drunken Boat. What's up with that? <laughs> That's a really good question. And I could kind of write another whole essay about it. But you know, one of the things when you go through a difficult moment, I think it's a litmus test to see who stands by you. And there are people who abandon you. And I, there are other people who like to swoop in like Harry and, and pick at the remains of uh, what, what and so anyway, long and short of it is there, uh, we had hired an executive director who turned out to be uh, siphoning funds and doing all these things. And we, when we asked her to leave, she kind of left the state in a vandalized with a bunch of code problems. And 
Um, I had to actually hire an intellectual property attorney to regain control of the magazine. It was all very ugly, and um, but I'm exhausted. It takes so long to run the magazine. And so it has been in advance, although we've been publishing books. We just published uh, Meridian, which is uh, a APWT in uh, Asia Pacific Writers and Translators anthology that has Vijay Sashadri writing it. So um, and I am in conversation with Tufts about resuscitating it. Um, mm -hmm. I just can't um, run the day-to-day -day operations, but I think that the space that Drunken Boat created is was really unique because uh, it was a home for works of art endemic to the medium of the web, sound, art, video, hypertext, digital animation, alongside more traditional forms of representation like poetry and prose and translation. And, uh, you know, it, it was a lot, a lot of work um, running it and the archives I think are really amazing. And I'm hoping that there will be some um, people who can kind of help resuscitate it, but I, uh, I don't think that's probably gonna be me. Well, fingers crossed. Um, thank you to the two of you for joining us this evening. Correctional is available for pre-order from Gibson's Bookstore and The Limits of the World is also available, not for pre-order, just for order. <laughs> uh, we are very pleased to have these two joining us tonight. Uh, any final thoughts that you wanna leave our audience with? Or show I, us your dog again. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Bring back Rishi. Always good oh, to end I an event Rishi, with a dog. Rishi was chewing everything in the room, so he's easy. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you very much to our audience members. Thank you to our authors. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks. Great. See you all. Thank you. Stay safe. Keep fighting. <laughs>